So, when someone dies or an event occurs, it stays with us for a long time. And sometimes there are special times of the year when the memory gets triggered. And this is a program about dealing with memories that may come up for people who have lost a loved one at some point. And here come the holidays. And you have events, you have rituals, routines, family gatherings, friends. And it can be a very challenging time. And so we have asked, we have asked Doug, and I have to flip my page here. There we go. We've asked Doug Schilling to come back. He actually gave us a talk earlier in the year. Uh, Doug is uh, manager of professional development at Community Hospice and Palliative Care. Uh, he has a background in, in uh, clinical education and professional development. He worked for a while at uh, Daniel Memorial. Uh, he actually uh, had his own uh, professional psychology counseling business at one time. And he didn't want me to read all this stuff, so I'm just going to say, Doug, it's all yours. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. So um, professional development is just our fancy word for our education department. Before coming uh, to uh, community hospice about 14 years ago now, um, my career was primarily in mental health as a therapist and a family therapist and lots of times working with uh, kids. So I've been able to kind of bring some of that background and experience to end-of-life care and hospice uh, work. And of course, when you work in end-of-life care and hospice work, one of the components of that is the work that you do with people after they've lost a loved one. And I will tell you that, that there can be a lot of misunderstandings out in the world related to things like grief and loss and what all of that means. And we sometimes use terms interchangeably for things. And so um, some of what I want to try to make sure we're doing today is being clear about the terminology that we're using in terms of what does grief really mean? When grief and loss and bereavement and mourning, we can sort of begin to use those terms interchangeably when they're when really they're not and they mean very specific things um, to talk about the kind of things that can predispose people to having um, uh, a more complicated or difficult bereavement or grieving kind of process and then to talk about strategies that are not a bad idea to be thinking about and applying and helping other people with when it comes to the fact that the holidays can be a very tough time for people. Sometimes for some people, just even thinking about the upcoming holidays and planning the upcoming holidays can trigger some um, emotional reactions in people. And, you know, we start thinking about this stuff and planning these things way ahead of time. So in October is not a bad time to actually start talking about it because many of us are already thinking about and planning what it is we're going to do during the holidays that are coming up and what we're going to not do during the holidays. So the reality is, and, and part of what I hope you take away from this, is that when we talk about the word grief, Grief is something that humans experience, and I think potentially other animals experience it a little bit too, but obviously not in the same way we do. Grief is something we experience any time we suffer a loss. Not simply the loss of a loved one through death or someone dying, and that's something that people tend to think. Uh, grief means somebody died when the reality is that as humans we grieve any loss that we experience. It's just a natural human experience to grieve. You lose a friend because they move to California, we grieve. You lose a job, we grieve. You lose some ability or functioning or something that you used to be able to do and you can't do anymore. We expect that there's a bit of a grief process with that. 
Now, losing a loved one obviously is the kind of experience, the kind of loss experience, that can really be the most significant in terms of producing grieving kind of reactions. But it's important for us to acknowledge that we grieve any kind of loss, and we grieve in a number of different ways. And not everybody, in fact, everybody does grieve in their own individual ways. And we'll talk more about that in a bit. But people can experience emotional reactions to grief. They can experience behavioral changes because they're grieving. And they can notice that they feel like their brain isn't working quite as well as it normally does, which we call cognitive changes when they're grieving as well. Can't tell you how many people I've heard who've experienced a loss who say, I just don't seem to be able to focus as well, or I'm forgetting things, or I don't seem to be able to rem um, solve problems as easy as I used to. And people who are working will say, gee, my boss noticed I'm just not doing as good a job. And, and it's because for some people, it can affect how well our brains are working um, from time to time. We think in the world of hospice and end-of-life care and doing bereavement and grief counseling with people um, that a wave is kind of a better metaphor for what grieving is like for most people. Lots of people think grief has stages. And, and it's like I'm in this stage of grief and then I graduate and I go to this stage and then I graduate and I go to this stage. In general, we've found in the work that we do with people that that's not really a very accurate way to think of grief. Partly because it misrepresents things for people who are grieving who say, gee, there must be something wrong with me because by now I should be in this stage, but I'm not, I'm still in this stage. Right? And they think there's something wrong with them or they're not doing a good job of their grieving when that's not really a good way to think of it at all. It's not very accurate in terms of how people experience grief. I think of grief as um, a, a roller coaster can be a good uh, metaphor in terms of there are times when you feel like you're up on top of things and you've got a handle on it. I got, my, I got my hands around this. I'm doing okay. And the next thing you know, you're down. You've taken the big plunge and you're down at the bottom of the roller coaster. A lot of people describe their grieving process as it was like I was there and, uh, in, at the beach in the ocean on a really nice day and the water was nice and calm and there I am standing you know with my back to the waves and the next thing I know a big wave comes along and knocks me on my butt because it's that sort of I felt like I was doing okay I didn't feel bad I thought I was moving forward and then something hit me um, and I felt like I was knocked for a loop so that's why we use that metaphor that grief is sort of like the standing in the ocean where suddenly something comes along and really knocks you for a loop. So this is a model that some folks who do a lot of research and work in the area of grief and bereavement and loss um, developed to sort of talk about what it can feel like to be in the grieving process. And if you start at the top, not unusual at all for people to initially have kind of a feeling of shock and maybe numbness and feeling as though their whole world is out of whack and unbalanced. They may um, uh, find themselves then experiencing this notion of kind of yearning for and longing for that lost person, that missing uh, person who's no longer there. Not unusual um, related to that for people to at times think they see their lost loved one in a crowd of people or somewhere. Um, oh, for a second there, I thought th th there, there was James. Um, and then I realized that that can't possibly be. Sometimes people end up here at the very bottom of the spiral with a lot of despair and a lot of feeling as though there's really not a whole lot of purpose or meaning in life anymore because of this loss that I've experienced. But almost always people continue with this cycle in one way or another, either on their own or with some help, maybe some grief counseling, brief counseling to sort of get to that point where they're ready for and able to kind of reorganize their lives a little bit. 
and to sort of see um, a meaning in life and moving forward. We'll talk more about that in a, in a bit as well. Not unusual, for example, when people come to uh, bereavement counseling to say, will I ever feel normal again? And so one of the things we sometimes say to people is, you may never feel exactly the way that you did before you lost somebody that you care about, but you can have a new normal. And we try to help people get their heads around the idea of a new normal and what that can mean. And that included in that new normal, there can be a component of looking forward to the future and being open to new relationships and new experiences and meaning in life and purpose in life and things that they can focus on wanting to accomplish before their time comes uh, to be in that situation. Mourning is more a word that has to do with the kind of rituals and customs that we surround the issue of death with. So, you know, if people wear black or people sit shiva or people, you know, sometimes they're religious or cultural kind of things that we learn over time or have part of our upbringing. Um, so mourning really is a word that has more to do with the kind of ways in which we outwardly display our grief and loss when, when someone dies. There's this phenomenon that we've referred to for a while now called anticipatory grief in which we, be, we, we start to see people exhibiting some of the signs of grieving before the actual loss or death of that loved one in anticipation of it. And sometimes we see our patients are experiencing anticipatory grief in terms of their own death coming up. There's, there's some research being done recently that is suggesting that the possibility of that things we've always thought were anticipatory grief may actually be a accumulation of some of the little things people have already lost. By that I mean, if you're at the point where, you know, uh, the medical world has suggested to you there's a possibility you only have six months left or so and you become a hospice patient, by that time in your life, you've already lost a significant amount of your health. You may have lost some uh, uh, economic situation because you've spent a lot of money trying to get curative care and uh, to hire caregivers potentially. You may have lost some of your identity in terms of the role that you were always able to play in life. You've definitely lost some functioning. And so really anticipatory grief may actually be that people are experiencing the accumulation of a bunch of little losses even before their loved one gets to the point of actually dying. Um, so uh, we, we'll see what, uh, what direction the research and studies that we're doing uh, leads us in regarding this. But what it, the bottom line is that really it's the, it's the appropriate term that we use right now for people who begin to show signs of grieving prior to the actual loss. Um, real quickly, another area we're studying in this whole world of uh, grief and loss has to do with something we call disenfranchised grief, which really has to do with the ways in which there are times when society doesn't really allow people to openly grieve and acknowledge their grieving because of some circumstances. And we've put some of those circumstances on the slide. So what are the ways in which we see and have a sense that people um, demonstrate and, and experience the, the um, grieving process. So some of, them are, 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 some of them are emotional, like sadness, of course, but sometimes it's just as normal to be angry about the loss, to be anxious and fearful about the future because of the loss. When you have, uh, you know, you're taking care of thousands of um, hospice patients a year, you hear a lot of them say, um, I'm really worried about what my future is going to be when, when my loved one dies because he or she always took care of this and took care of that and I, I don't know how to do that. And so I'm worried and I'm fearful and um, you know, you also hear that from people whose loved one who took care of a lot of things died suddenly and they never had the chance to prepare and learn how to take care of themselves. And so one of their reactions sometimes is fear and anxiety and worry. 
There are times when it's normal for people to feel a bit of a sense of relief when their loved one has died because of the suffering that they may have seen their loved one going through. And so there may be a small part of them that also feels a bit of relief. It's not unusual, though, for us as humans, when we, have, when we acknowledge that we have a bit of relief, then we also tend to feel guilty about it. I shouldn't feel relief for that. That's not, what kind of bad wife am I? What kind of bad husband, child, whatever am I? That, I'm, that I felt any relief that this person died. And yet, it's a normal feeling for some people to have. It's certainly within the normal range of emotional experience for some people to have at the loss of a loved one. We see people who, who um, uh, develop physical indications, like the ones up there, whether that's fatigue or whether that's um, you know, a loss of appetite, not being able to sleep. Sometimes we see some folks who develop some of the same symptoms that their loved one who died had, and it's almost as if unconsciously they have um, uh, connected with that loved one who's now gone by having some of the same symptoms. I've seen people who lost a loved one to uh, a COPD, a breathing problem, who began to suffer shortness of breath themselves from time to time. Um, interesting phenomenon. People who are connected with each other. And, you know, you've probably heard lots of stories, and in hospice we've seen it, where somebody dies of what we say is a broken heart where their loved one dies and within a relatively short period of time, even though they hadn't been real sick, they die too. We, we experience that phenomenon. We see that happening from time to time. And of course, the cognitive ways in which we, we just don't feel like our brains are working as well. We're not doing great uh, executive functioning. Uh, we have a harder time sequencing things and planning things and solving problems and remembering things that normally we would not have a problem with. Sometimes what we see are the two extremes of changes in social behavior. Sometimes people withdraw and isolate themselves when they're grieving. Other people go out their way to make sure they're spending as much time socializing as they possibly can. Those people, for example, may not like being at home where their loved one died or where there are things that remind them in a painful way of their loved one who died. And so they try to spend all their time out of the home running around with their friends and doing things and we, and we get that. Um, on a certain level. Then there are other people who feel like, I'm just not up for socializing. I think I'm just going to stay put here and have, and be quiet in my own l little world. Um, we see some people who tend to get sort of agitated and more likely to fly off the handle at people, and they, their fuses get shorter. And we can encounter those people who we know have experienced a loss, and suddenly they're snapping at everybody, and you're like, hey, don't take it out on me, yeah, right? That can be within the normal range of emotional and behavioral kind of changes that people go through. And of course, the, the question can come up from time to time that people, um, because of this experience, may begin to question their faith and their spirituality a little bit. Why did God do this? Why did God take this person from me? Um, and so sometimes it can be um, lead to some um, spiritual questioning or spiritual changes. Um, I've always been a devout fill-in-the-blank, but now that this happened to me, I'm not so sure that's what I should do. Maybe I've got to rethink this thing, that kind of stuff. So the other guy that is a big um, researcher and studier and writer and thinker in the term, world of grief and bereavement and loss is a guy named William Warden uh, who lives out in California and he's been doing this work for quite a while now. He's actually getting sick. He's in his mid to upper 80s now. Um, and we were actually going to bring him into town last year to do a presentation for us, but his health wouldn't uh, allow it. But he really has written the book on how bereavement counselors and grief counselors can best work with people who are grieving. And these are the tasks that he thinks people have to work through when they're 
uh, trying to heal from and resolve their grief. So accepting on an intellectual level the loss, the reality of the loss of this loved one, allowing themselves to experience the emotional reactions and the pain of that loss, being ready to begin to adjust to and work toward adjusting to a new environment, a new reality, that new normal that I referred to earlier, and being ready to kind of emotionally reinvest in relationships and in life and in accomplishing things to move forward. And when people are able to pretty successfully accomplish these tasks, more often than not, their grief resolves itself. Um, it doesn't mean they're ever going to forget that loved one. It doesn't mean they're ever going to feel the same normal that they used to. Um, but we would view somebody that does a reasonably good job of accomplishing this task, these tasks as having mostly healed from and worked through their grieving process. I don't think any of these are particularly important given that we want to try to be careful about time. These are the kind of things that can go into the possibility that somebody's grieving process may be harder and more what we call complicated grief. And complicated grief is the word we use to sort of describe the person is really struggling with and not um, um, uh, feeling much healing through their grieving process. When a death is sudden or unexpected or there are multiple deaths that somebody uh, of people that they are connected to, they experience, um, those things can make the whole process of grieving harder. A violent death or violent situations in which somebody that you care about dies can make it more likely that you're going to have complicated grief. And after that person dies, things that can, can increase the likelihood that you're going to have a harder time with your grief are not having much in, in terms of a social support. If your life already has a lot of other stressors or instabilities in it, that could make it harder for you to accomplish that. Now, because we know that the, group, that the holidays can be an emotional and literal trigger for things, you know, we talk a little bit about the secondary losses that go along with having a loved one, a family member, somebody you care about die, um, and some of the examples of those kinds of things. You know, usually everybody in a family has a certain role that they play within the holidays, and now that person is gone. You know, maybe it's the person who leads the um, um, Christmas carols. Um, I know my wife, for example, her grandfather, who lived to be in his upper 90s, uh, played the piano. And so every holiday, and especially Christmas, Grandpa would go to the piano and play the piano, and everybody would sing Christmas carols. Well, at that, on that day, that first Christmas we had when he was gone, we were missing that. Um, we didn't have somebody to play that role, and so that was another little secondary loss. So I had to sort of be a, a weak substitute playing the guitar instead of the piano uh, uh, at that time, right? Um, and, and these are some other uh, kind of possible situations. Some families get used to, we always spend Thanksgiving at so-and-so's house. Right? Well, if so-and-so is not there anymore, you're not having Thanksgiving at their house. That's a loss for the other people who have to get used to that change and that, that new place. Right? Hopefully, they get to go someplace really great and can start a new tradition and a new ritual that they can invest in and feel good about. The kind of things that can potentially trigger a, a reaction when somebody is... Um, grieving the loss of a loved one around the holidays are these things. Just going and buying a gift and at some point you realize, oh, I don't have to get a gift for him or her anymore. Just there in the middle of the mall when you're buying some gifts, when that thought hits you, that can be an overwhelming experience for people in terms of having a very strong emotional reaction to it. As you're preparing and planning things and again you're planning out who's going to be doing what and somebody always brings the pumpkin pie and that person's not there anymore right 
in general, the holidays can engender in a lot of people, even when they haven't experienced a loss, some of what we refer to as the holiday blues. And sometimes that's related to having an awareness that holidays as a child maybe weren't very good. Um, or, you know, if you came, for example, from an abusive family where you didn't look forward to the holidays where dad got drunk and started whacking people around. Um, so the holidays can, uh, for some people, already have kind of an inherently negative connotation. It doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen for some people. Music and, and um, sound-related things are attached to very powerful memories for us, and especially music. If you think about it, if I asked you to write down the name of a song that always brings up a certain memory to you, I'll bet you all could do it. Um, sometimes if I say to somebody, what's your favorite song? It's because there's some special memory or event that's attached to that music. And so for some people, just the fact that those Christmas carols start playing 24 hours a day on the radio can bring back certain memories or can make someone be more in touch with the fact that this is the first holiday I don't get to spend with fill in the blank, whomever that person is. The other thing that we don't talk as much about, but is really an amazingly powerful sense in terms of being connected to memories is the sense of smell. And so even if it's just the smell of a Christmas tree, if I ask you to imagine that for a second, that is almost universally a smell that people describe as being a really a sm a smell they like. Right? And almost always, if in the middle of July you're walking somewhere and you smell the, uh, the, a pine tree smell of a, like a Christmas tree, it's going to bring up memories and thoughts of the holidays. Right? Smells can be very, a very powerful sense in terms of connecting with good and bad memories and thoughts and feelings. I love the first point of this bullet point, of this particular slide. Coping is struggling successfully with difficult challenges. We tend to think of coping as meaning everything is fine and perfect and I'm over it. That's not really the point of what coping means. Coping means it's still a challenge and it's still a struggle. It's just that you are successfully struggling to move on. Doesn't mean it's not a struggle anymore. Just like a great definition for courage is not that I wasn't afraid to run into that building to save somebody. Yeah, I was scared to death, but I did it anyway. And so a great definition of courage is something that we do even though it does scare us. Coping is something we do even though it's hard and even though we're struggling to do it. So we all have to give ourselves credit for, as opposed to thinking that is a light switch that's either on or off, I'm either coping or I'm not, that it's more like a dimmer switch. Coping is, will continue to perhaps be a struggle, but I'm more successful than not against that challenge. So here are some tips regarding to helping people cope and adjust um, to the realities that um, the holidays can bring on for people reg regarding grief and loss. So I love that a good way to remember them is the three C's. First of all, we encourage people to give themselves permission to make choices leading up to and during the holidays. That that's OK. If you choose that you don't want to go to midnight mass this year uh, because you, in anticipation of that, it makes you feel very sad. It makes you feel upset. You think that's going to be a bad experience. You've got to give yourself permission that this year that's an OK choice to make. It's important for us to think about these things and make choices based on what our insides are telling us. Communicate to other people how we're feeling about things and the kind of choices we're going to make. 
Yeah, maybe some of the other family members are a little annoyed that you're not going to go with them to Midnight Mass, but you know what? This year it's important and you can tell them, this year for me, the best choice I can make um, is to decide I, I don't want to go to Midnight Mass with you all. I hope you all can accept that. But you got to communicate it, you got to talk about it so people know where you're coming from and people know what to expect. Also, because when you talk about these things and you talk about these feelings, it's one of the ways that we download some of the stuff that builds up inside of us. Sometimes when I'm doing presentations, I bring a little can of soda with me and I tell people to uh, give me things that stress them out. And when they do, then I hand them the can of soda and I ask them to shake it up. I go around the room and everybody shakes up the can and then I go to one last person and say, here, now you open up the can. Of course, I never make them actually open the can, but my point is what I'm trying to illustrate is that when bad, stressful, upsetting things happen to us, we become like that can of Coke that a lot of pressure is building up inside. And then what happens frequently is some other little life event comes along that normally wouldn't blow us out of the water and normally we could just adjust to, but this time we find ourselves exploding like a can of Coke over everybody. And it's because that, that pressure inside that can got so high from all those shaking ups. And, and we can be like that too. Wouldn't it be great if every can of Coke had a little release valve where you could release some of the pressure so no matter how much it got shaken up, you could let off some of the steam and open your Coke without any problem. Well, for people, one of the ways we do that is to be willing to talk about with people who are supportive and caring and non-toxic, those feelings that are building up inside of us. Then we've got less of a chance of ending up being a can of Coke that explodes all over everybody that you don't want it to because some other little life event comes around and that was the last straw that pushed us over. People have to know that they have to be willing to and accept and give themselves permission. They may have to make some compromises during the holidays in order to make sure that their healing process continues and that they don't put themselves in a position where they're moving backwards instead of forward. And so I come from a family. I've got uh, four siblings. Um, I'm the only boy, so I've got four sisters. Imagine that, guys. I'm a middle child. And everybody in our family, I love all, the, all of my family, uh, they're great, uh, but they've all, just like me, got their own little quirks. And sometimes when we get back together as a family for events, that may be a little stressful, because even holidays can be stressful, you know, some old patterns of craziness come back up, and there have been, <laughs> so to speak. And there have been times when, after I got trained and got some experience and had a really good family therapy coach myself, I started to realize that part of what was going to work best for me is if I made some compromises about how much time I was going to spend in the midst of that, what can be uh, some chaos, swirling vortex of chaos in my family. Uh, and th that had to do with compromise and accepting some things, making some choices, setting some limits. Because then for me and for other people in my family, the whole experience of the time we did spend together um, was going to be better. Anytime people who are grieving can maintain as much of a normal routine as possible, they're going to do better. So even things like they may struggle with eating or having an appetite or sleeping, but the more that they can force themselves to try to have a normal routine of things that they do and um, when they do them, the better. Because there is something to the notion that I know my mother told me, and I wouldn't be surprised if other mothers didn't tell people, that if you want to feel normal, do normal things. When you do normal things, you feel more normal. There is a little something to that, as well as the fact that we can get our systems, our health out of whack when we don't continue to do our routines and take care of ourselves. Then our immune systems get compromised, and then we get sick, and all kind of things can happen. We tend to um, perhaps overdo things at times when we're grieving, and we fall into the risk of abusing various substances, from food to prescriptions to alcohol, 
Most of the things as people we tend to abuse, like alcohol and prescriptions, tend to be things that depress our central nervous system anyway, even though they may make us feel really happy for a short period of time or euphoric anyway. Almost all of those things tend to be central nervous system depressants. And if you depress your central nervous system over time, the you increase the likelihood that you'll actually develop a clinical depression which is the opposite of what you're trying to do when you're grieving and you're trying to move forward and be healthy and heal. You know, it's okay to uh, uh, do these two things in combination. Give yourself permission to avoid toxic people that are complainers, that are negative Nellies, that bring you down, that you have to sort of muster all your strength just to spend time with them or you're stressed out and to try to make sure you're spending time with the other side of that coin. Those folks who are supportive and caring and understanding and empathetic because of your situation. It's also okay, and this is funny, uh, to, at least to me, when we, when we experience a death of someone that we are connected to and care about, the people that we know and that know us or our family members, what's one of the things they tend to do and bring us? food, right? So we end up with about 47 frozen casseroles in the freezer, or we have to go buy a new freezer for the garage because everybody that comes to see us thinks they're going to help us and that the best thing they can do for us is bring us more food. You know, and so we've got 20 tuna fish casseroles in the freezer that we'll never get around to eating. One of the things that I tell all caregivers, and I also tell people under these circumstances, it's okay and you can give yourself permission that if somebody says they're going to come and see you, is there anything I can bring you, for you to tell them what would work best for you. It's okay for you to say, you know, I haven't been able to get to the grocery store. Can you stop and bring me a gallon of milk or a, um, a loaf of bread? Rather than that another tuna casserole um, that you'll just end up in the freezer with, right? It's okay to do that. People tend to think, oh, I can't do that. They're being nice to me anyway. They're coming. Well, I can't tell them what to bring me. Um, I tell people it is okay. You're under a circumstance right then that gives you the right to do that. Because you know what? Think about it. If you had a friend under those circumstances and you were going to go visit them and you were trying to figure out what the best thing you could do for them would be, wouldn't you want them to tell you so you knew you were doing exactly what they needed the most? Well, if it's true from that standpoint, it's OK for you to do that too. It's important for us to help remind people sometimes during the holidays when you're grieving, you got to keep your expectations low and know that there may be some triggers and know that this may not likely be the happiest holiday you have ever had. That's OK. Maybe limit some of what you're going to do, how much you're going to do. Keep your expectations low. Some people really enjoy and feel much better when they can plan something that honors or memorializes, keeps that lost person alive in their hearts and minds and with other family members. So we encourage people to think about and if they want to, to plan something that is a way to honor that loved one or memorialize that loved one. Maybe you're going to let go one of those balloons with the, with the a candle in it that floats up. Whatever ritual or ceremony is meaningful and helpful to you can be a good thing. Right? You've got to be patient and understanding of yourself and forgiving of yourself when you're grieving as well as hoping and, uh, that other people will have that same patience with you as well. Always good to try to look for ways to reduce the number of other stressors that you've got to do. That list of things I've got to get done before Thanksgiving dinner, we all sit down. If it can go from 15 things on a normal year down to five things this year, that would be a good thing. Unless you're the type that the best way you cope with difficulty is by staying as busy as possible. But more often than not, people who do that and try to busy themselves with things eventually crash even harder than they would have in the first place. So cutting back on it, cutting yourself some slack, and trying not to overdo things is something you really should give yourself permission to do.
We love rituals and we think rituals are important. Human beings didn't develop rituals coincidentally or out of the blue for no reason. We, we are um, a species that uses and likes rituals because they are helpful and meaningful to us in some sort of way. And so I encourage the use of rituals for people um, when they are uh, grieving and through the process of healing their grief. Um, and again, they can be a completely private, like a visit to the gravesite, or they can be something public, like gathering a group of friends and releasing uh, the balloon up into the air that memorializes and honors that person who's lost. So we've got some different kinds of, of rituals that we talk about. Rituals of continuity are ways in which we keep that person who's died and we've lost alive and meaningful in our hearts and minds. Helps us stay connected to that person. Grandpa always had one little shot of Jack Daniels uh, before Thanksgiving dinner and we're all going to do the same thing and we're going to raise a toast to Grandpa. That's something I made up out of the top of my mind. Uh, but um, <laughs> you, you see my point. That keeps grandpa alive in a certain way by maintaining that ritual. Rituals of transitions are ways in which we say to ourselves, we're going to start a new tradition or a new ritual as a way to acknowledge and punctuate that we're moving forward. And so some people like doing both. Some people like doing a ritual of continuity that says, Grandpa, you're still here with us. But here, we're going to start a new tradition this year. Um, and we're going to do this as well to, as a way to signal to all of us we're moving forward and life still has meaning and importance and there are going to be new things that we're going to experience. Rituals of reconciliation are ways in which people who have lost someone that they feel they didn't get to make amends with or fix a problem or resolve something, that they can do that. We've encouraged people, for example, who are in bereavement counseling, bless you, um, to write letters to a loved one who's gone as a way to reconcile something. And maybe if they're feeling, I feel so guilty, I never had a chance to apologize uh, to my father for calling him a jerk. Um, and then two days later, he died of a heart attack. Right? OK, let's write him a letter. What can you say to, to him when you go to visit his gravesite? Would you like to apologize there? Would you like to, right? And so reconciliation is a ritual that a lot of people like doing and want to do because they feel like they had unfinished business. So what kind of things, you know, activities can we do? Plan a special remembrance ceremony. Look at pictures. Look at movies. Play music that you knew that person loved. That way you're staying connected to the memory of that person and keeping them alive certain kind of way. You know, when you raise the shot glass uh, with the Jack Daniels, you know, you make a toast to grandpa. Some people feel like a very formal ritual like lighting a candle, whether that's in a church, you know, put the, I went to Catholic school for 12 years, grew up Catholic, and so I know about, you know, put your quarter in the box, light the candle, and you know, the whole thing. Um, and still at times I uh, have done that. Um, and so, and, th and that feels a little more formal and feels a little more connected to something uh, specific, like a religious component. You know, do we want to put up a stocking uh, on the mantle or around the Christmas tree uh, for a grandpa? And maybe, you know, put that little bottle of Jack Daniels in the stocking, I don't know. Do we want to, to connect death and loss with life and the future by planting a tree or planting some other sort of plant. Um, and and uh, in that way, uh, we keep that person we've lost alive through the connection that we have to them in our minds with this living, growing thing that moves forward. Again, the notion that they are sort of common universal stages of grieving is something we've sort of given up. And we've come to realize that personal journeys 
uh, through grief and personal pathways are a more accurate representation of what grieving is. That everybody's grieving is their own journey with some commonalities. Not unusual for there to be certain commonalities among most people who are grieving, but everybody's individual journey is their individual journey. We have worked in the direction now in bereavement counseling and grief counseling of uh, doing more of um, the renewing relationships as well as acknowledging relinquishing ties to uh, that lost loved one, that both ends of that are important. Um, and that to whatever extent people can feel as though they are actively doing things in their process of their grief is probably better um, in the long run than simply feeling as though grief is something that happens to me as opposed to grief is something that I can be a part of working through and walking through and living through and healing from. Not going to say a whole lot about that because I think it's sort of self-explanatory unless you end up having questions about it. Um, and it can be very difficult for people because of the things that can, are connected in their minds to that loved one, whether it's going through their clothes after they're gone and deciding you know, what's going to be given to whom and, or kept or donated somewhere. Um, things like certain perfumes or colognes and can be triggers and bring back certain things and certainly jewelry and other things. Some people really are comforted by and prefer to have grandpa's ashes on the mantle and that's a good experience for them and then for other people that's not the best plan and the best idea because walking into the living room every time and seeing grandpa there on the mantle just reminds them of the sad unpleasant unhappy feelings that they have about the fact that grandpa's gone. So we have to tailor these things on an individual basis in terms of what makes me feel good, what makes me feel bad. It's probably not a great idea to throw everything that reminds you of a lost one away in the first week or six months or maybe even year. Because you may regret it after three years when you've gone farther down your road of healing because then you might actually be um, comforted by seeing that. So we tell people, not a great idea to make huge decisions for a year after losing a loved one that you're very close to. Um, not a good idea to get rid of every absolute thing that, rem put it in a box, put it somewhere where you don't have to see it all the time for a while, and that's okay. But you may, at some point in the future, regret that you don't have some connection or some belonging because it actually makes you feel good when you see it at that point. These are the two things that we really are trying to work with people on accomplishing through the process of bereavement or grief counseling. And they sort of run simultaneously, not unusual, for example, to see people who are in grief counseling who are working on some of these things a little bit and then they are working on some of these things and then back and forth and sometimes they're working on some of both of these things at the same time. And the reason we call it a dual process uh, model is that the two areas really have to do with working on the issues of the loss and then working on the issues of future orientation, getting your motor running again, being ready to live life, um, feeling more restored and healed from that grieving experience you've had. And so again, because it's like being at the ocean and sometimes you're standing upright and moving forward and sometimes you're sitting on your butt in the water because a big wave came and knocked you over, you know, sometimes people are more focused on working on the issues they're experiencing related to the loss and the emotion of that and the intellectual notion of that. And sometimes people are more focused on working on the whole moving forward, new normal, life has meaning, life has purpose. 
There can be future relationships for me. I'm working on getting my support system um, as helpful as possible. Um, and that's why it's OK for people to sort of be working back and forth between these two things. And again, each person's journey is their own. Make sense? OK, bottom line, we do have a bereavement counseling department at Community Hospice. Um, that we provide a bereavement counseling services for up to 13 months for anybody who's lost a patient um, in community hospice. We do have groups. We see people individually. We've got special services of remembrance. And we have a really special need weekend therapeutic camp for kids who have lost a loved one between the ages of 7 and 17. That's called Camp Healing Powers. Um, and so we really try to go above and beyond, not only in terms of taking care of people leading up to and at the time of their deaths, but also those people who will still be here after that person's gone and provide them with bereavement counseling options for up to 13 months after that they've lost someone. So enough about the infomercial. Um, BL, I'm always happy to answer questions or to clarify anything that I didn't do anything but confuse you about. So, um. uh, Doug, actually, you answered my question with the, that last slide because I was going to ask, what does community hospice offer the community right. in terms of actual help? And so anybody really can call that number and say, I'm thinking it might be useful for me to get an assessment to see if I could benefit from bereavement counseling. Because you can come in and get a free assessment. And again, especially if you've been connected to a, a, somebody that was a hospice, a community hospice patient, you know, we offer those services at absolutely no cost to anybody. Um, and we have some groups that even if you didn't lose somebody in, as a hospice patient, you can attend the groups uh, at no cost. Um, we, we cannot provide individual counseling for anybody from the community now who was not connected to a hospice patient. We used to do that, but it got way too expensive to do. Um, and the, fa the fact is that we go way above and beyond what we're required to do in terms of providing bereavement counseling services to people. Um, so. Um, that's what's available, and um, that's, uh, wait a minute, that's, there's a number here <laughs> that you can call, um, and it's in, uh, oh, no, you don't have handouts. Anybody that didn't see it and wants it, either Maria or Levon, you know, somebody connected to us will be able to provide that for you. Just be aware that it exists. Not everybody needs bereavement counseling. The reality is about 15% of some of people that lose a loved one um, benefit from and really need bereavement counseling in a formal kind of way. That means 85% of people really work through the grieving process pretty successfully on their own. Um, anytime you use more of those tips and try to follow some of those ideas, you have a greater chance of resolving that and not needing formal. But we want to be there for anybody that does or even has a question. Am I going crazy or is this normal? Because sometimes the best feeling you can have and the best information you can get when you're feeling kind of crazy is for somebody who's an expert to say to you, you know what? What you're going through is pretty normal. You're not crazy. Don't worry about it. If this continues for another month or gets really worse, then give us another call and maybe we'll talk about it. But you know what? Take a deep breath. You're doing OK. This is a normal part of grieving. And we love it when that's what we get to tell people because you see people, a light come on in their face when they find out they're not crazy, that they're just experiencing what is a pretty normal response to losing somebody they care about. Uh, in grieving. 